Hello, and welcome to the January 2021 virtual roundtable session for ICAF's 2020's virtual conference programming. My name is Biz Nidham, and I'm currently serving as the treasurer for the International Comic Arts Forum. It's my pleasure to host this evening's event. Originally, the ICAF 2020 conference was to be held concurrently with the Small Press Expo in September 2020. Because of COVID-19, our conference was canceled. So we have reimagined a way for accepted ICAF panelists to make their contribution to ICAF and have, organi have organized a series of online events to achieve ICAF's mission of celebrating comics through scholarship. Over the next several months, ICAF will continue to host monthly virtual panels and roundtables alongside a series of weekly blog posts featuring accepted ICAF presentations. All panelists who are accepted to ICAF 2020 have been welcomed to participate in our online programming with the intention of curating monthly virtual events around specific themes. Please see ICAF's website for more information on our upcoming events, as well as for the pre-recorded talks from our panel of roundtable participants and links to their presentation transcripts. Today's virtual session is entitled, New Perspectives on Reading Comics. It's been my pleasure to co-organize this roundtable event series with ICAF Program Director Frank Bramlett, and we would like to express our gratitude to the other members of ICAF's Executive Committee for their support. More importantly, however, we'd like to thank the panelists for the virtual panel associated with tonight's roundtable, Elf Pau, Jakub Janowski, and Deborah Shamoon, for giving us the opportunity to have this rich conversation about their work. Unfortunately, Jakub Jankowski was unable to participate in this evening's event. I would, however, encourage our webinar audience to review his presentation on the ICAF website, if you have not done so already. And I know Jakob would be thrilled to take your questions via email and social media. For tonight's event, my co-organizer, Frank Bramlett, has agreed to moderate the roundtable discussion. Frank Bramlett is a professor in the English department at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. As a linguist, he specializes in discourse analysis, sociolinguistics, and teaching English to speakers of other languages. Currently, his work in linguistics is a, is a percep perceptual dialect geography project about languages spoken in the state of Nebraska. In comics research, Frank continues to work on issues of the quotidian in comics, as well as gender, sexuality, and linguistic identity. Frank is the program director for the ICAF Executive Committee, and he is also an associate editor for INC, the Journal of the Comic Study Society. But before we begin our roundtable session, a note on the technical side of the Zoom webinar event. First of all, this event is being recorded and will be posted online on the ICAF website after its conclusion. We are also leaving the chat function on so that members of the webinar are able to discuss the presentations or communicate with me regarding issues. However, I will be moderating the chat and I ask that all conversation be thoughtful and respectful as well as mindful of how excessive chatting can be distracting for all participants in today's webinar. Soon after the panelists have given a short summary of their research, we will open the floor for questions. Please submit all questions via the Q&A function, which you will find at the top or the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will endeavor to get to as many questions as possible within the, within the time available to us, though we apologize in advance if we are not able to address all inquiry. We are grateful that we can provide free access to our conference events this year. But if, you, if you're able, we would welcome your donations through our PayPal account to help support the costs of hosting our online programming. You can find the button to donate at the bottom of the ICAF homepage, which is located at www.internationalcomicartsforum.org. Thank you again to everyone for helping to make tonight's event happen. So without further ado, I'll ask our moderator to take the lead in introducing our roundtable participants. Thank you, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Biz. I'm thrilled to be able to moderate our panel on new perspectives and reading comics. Our panel is organized similarly to the previous ICAF virtual panels. I'll begin by introducing our participants. Then each participant will give a brief summary of their presentation. At that time, I'll start the conversation with a few questions and then we'll also take questions from the audience. Unfortunately, as Biz said earlier, Jakub is unable to attend the panel and join us in conversation, but we hope that all the audience members will listen to his presentation because it is a wonderful examination of different theories of comic book reading practice. 
I do want to introduce him though, because of his important contributions to our panel. Jakub Jankowski is an assistant professor at the Institute of Iberian and Ibero-American Studies at the University of Warsaw, a comic book translator from Spanish, Portuguese, English, and a member of the Polish Comic Book Association. He is the winner of the first Dr. Tomas Marcianic Award for the scientific text on comics about Joe Sacco's works. In 2017, Jakub was awarded the Rector's Award of the University of Warsaw for his scientific achievements for the year 2016. He is a member of the Polish Management Committee for the Cost Action Investigation on Comics and Graphic Novels in the Iberian Cultural Area. And he's an active member of the Working Group 3 Iberian Comics as a form of intercultural dialogue. Currently, Jakub is working in three major fields, theory and practice of translating comic books from Portuguese, Spanish, and English, comic books as a didactic tool, from translation exercises to classroom use, and socio-political problems in the Portuguese-speaking countries and their reflection in artistic production. Elkpa is a self-published Seattle comics artist and queer trans dude who uses he, him, and his pronouns. He's currently working on a sailing travelogue called Foss Follies, set in the South Sound. He performs regularly as half of the cartoon band Spooky Action, and he hosts a monthly international animated children's film series called Saturday Morning Cartoons at SIF Cinema Uptown. He's from Seattle, but is currently in Chicago to get a master's degree in visual and critical studies at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's currently applying for PhD programs to continue making philosophy comics. Our third presenter, Deborah Shamoon, is an associate professor in the Department of Japanese Studies and the National University of Singapore. Her research area is modern Japanese literature and popular culture, with particular emphasis on narrative and visual analysis of manga. She is the author of Passionate Friendship, The Aesthetics of Girls' Culture in Japan, published in 2012 by University of Hawaii Press, a history of shoujo manga, girls comics. Her current research is on the development of manga narrative in the 1950s and 1960s. At this time, I would invite Deborah to start our panel by giving us her presentation. And then after that, Elk will follow up with his presentation. So Deborah, I'd ask you to start your camera and uh, give us your presentation. Okay, hello. Great, thanks very much. I'm really happy to have the opportunity to address you address you today. Uh, and thanks also for having this panel at kind of an unusual time for the US so that we can accommodate uh, Singapore time. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to share the screen and show you my PowerPoint. Uh, and hopefully that will work okay. Okay. Uh, so this is the same PowerPoint that is in the recorded lecture, uh, the conference presentation. Hopefully most of you got a chance to see it. Uh, but in case you didn't, I'm just going to summarize really briefly. Um, so uh, this is part of a larger project that I'm working on that will hopefully eventually be a book on the development of uh, visual and uh, a text narrative in manga um, with some comparisons to US comics uh, and uh, other Western comics, although my focus really is on manga. Um, and uh, my goal in this project is to bring together the discourses of uh, comic studies and manga studies in English and in Japanese, because often these two fields really don't talk to each other. And then my other goal in this also is to bring shoujo manga or comics to girls into the larger discussion on the uh, development of manga, because usually shoujo manga is uh, left to the side or talked about as an exception or a, a, a separate case, when I don't think that is true at all. Uh, so my focus in this presentation is to talk about first and third person narration. Um, and I, I use this uh, four panel strip by Art Spiegelman to get into this, where he talks about uh, 
the difference between speech balloons and text boxes. And, and there's another option that he doesn't discuss here because you don't usually see it in, uh, in American comics, but that is narration that is outside of speech balloons or text boxes, and that is closer to a kind of first person interior monologue. Uh, and then I sort of I go through the history of how in Western comics, uh, often the art is separated uh, from the text. Um, and in Japan, although you sometimes see that, as in this case, that's uh, not usually the case. Um, from the uh, 1950s, 1960s onward, um, particularly in shoujo manga, you start to see a uh, first person narration uh, like here that is layered over and uh, becomes an artistic element uh, within the artwork. And it's because these are stories of um, uh, teenage development that really focus on the interiority and psychological development of the um, teen character. Uh, and, and so uh, it's another example of the um, internal monologue of the main character uh, that becomes like first person narration. Uh, some other examples of that. Uh, and, and here also, um, uh, you can really see how it's become kind of an artistic element. Uh, and then I talk about how actually we do see first person narration even in um, Western comics, uh, but it's always set off in text boxes. And then I go back and look at uh, Daredevil in the 60s and how with the kind of weird things that were going on um, with this Stanley style narration uh, in this very chatty tone. Uh, and, and then I give some examples from Western uh, comics where the um, narration is, or the, um, uh, yeah, the narration is integrated into the art, but I think there's a big difference between what you see in saga and what you see in uh, shoujo manga um, because uh, this is an action-based comic and um, the narrator is clearly speaking from the future and reflecting on the past, whereas in uh, shoujo manga, it's a kind of stream of consciousness. Um, and then I uh, talk about how uh, um, narration works in some examples of American and French uh, autobiographical comics uh, and how it's still kind of set off, uh, it's separated from the art. Uh, but then I, there are a couple examples, I think, of American comics where you really see the art integrated into the text, similar to what you see in shoujo manga. Um, and it's not an accident, I think, that these are um, teen coming of age stories. Uh, and so uh, this style seems to work for this style, for this type of story. Okay, uh, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, and I, I look forward to hearing your questions and discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Deborah, for that introduction to your presentation. And now I'll ask Elk if uh, he could start his camera and then give us his presentation too. Hey, um, my name is Elk. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to speak. I'm really excited to be a part of ICAF for the first time. Um, I was thinking if you want, um, well, my, my project that I submitted to ICAF is actually a website. So if you wanted to open up your phones or even open a tab on your computer, I know this could potentially be really distracting. So do it at your own risk, but you can just type in 4D time dot space. And you can check out my project firsthand. Um, I also thought it might be cool to share the screen here. And hello, me within a me. I'm just gonna type this in here. Space. Oh, goodness. Well, my internet wasn't going very well. Um, here, we'll scratch that. Let's see, sorry, I'm not very good with Zoom. Um, I'm guessing everyone's still there. Anyways, I'll just explain to you what's going on on the website. Um, it's basically about four dimensionalism, um, which is a type of philosophy of time that basically argues that all of time and space um, is connected and shared in one universe, a block universe. So you'll have the length, width, and height which are the normal three dimensions that we can perceive with our eyes. The fourth dimension is actually time. So in the comic, 
slash webcomic slash website, I go through the history of the fourth dimension and I approach it um, in terms of geometry. And then I start to talk about how four dimensionalism can actually impact um, not only the way that we read comics, which is what this panel is about, but also how we can approach our own understandings of the self. Um, I coined the term a space-time sausage, um, which is basically the subject through time extended four-dimensionally. So like if you imagine yourself um, from birth all the way through death, that one world line of your existence can be considered a space-time sausage. Um, let's see, I talk a little bit about film theory, but mostly I talk about comics formalism, um, which is where we come into this presentation's relevance. Um, I basically make the argument that like a four-dimensional block universe, each book, particularly comic books, is also a 4D hyperobject. So you could see each panel as a slice of space-time, like a one captured moment. And that through the thickness of the book, you actually get um, the fourth dimension there. So you basically, with the movement of your eyes across the page, you control the time element. And then with the thickness of the book, you get um, a 4D hyper object that contains the entirety of the story from beginning to end that exists basically on its own, suspended timelessly, like the block universe itself. Um, I go into a little bit about um, how you can consider autobiographical comics four-dimensionally and how the subject, because I make autobiographical comics, there's some context there. This comic is also autobiographical, so like I'm the narrator. Um, and I talk about through my body of work, how I've created a little 4D space-time sausage of myself as a character in autobiography. Um, then I talk, I talk about string theory and how comics is a multiples medium and how the printing press basically has an impact on the form itself and how it's perceived um, and how that relates to multiple universe theory, which I think is an interesting topic, albeit a little, I guess, obscure. Um, I finish by talking, by basically explaining my newfangled idea of the block universe called the corkscrew block universe, where I look at agrarian cycles of time and basically make the argument that time should be moving forward in like a corkscrew motion, basically making like a tube, like a 4D tube, um, because that sort of that basically puts to rest our worries about fatalism and also the idea that you can feel time passing. Um, and I, I bring in Nietzsche at the end there and talk about the death of Superman also it's for you um, Superman fans out there. So highly recommend you check that out. Um, I also have a couple of pages that are bookended on there that are more autobiographical talking about like how I got into the fourth dimension in the first place and then also my experiences with four like my four dimensional experiences growing up which is pretty funny stuff so um yeah you can find that all at 40 time.space I also did a blog post in which I'm very <laughs> I'm a bit clearer than I think right now um but yeah thanks Thank you, Elk. That's that's terrific. Um, and at this time, I would ask both Elk and Deborah to turn on their cameras and microphones, and we'll start our, our roundtable conversation. Um, one thing that I would like to tell the audience, uh, in case you have not been able to attend an ICAF conference in person, we we always try to blend academic work with comics makers' work. And so I think that this panel is an especially good example of the way that we can bring many different voices and perspectives in conversation with each other. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm so, I was so happy to be able to um, be on the panel with Deborah and Elk and Jakub. So, um, okay, let's start with some questions then. Uh, this question is actually for both of you. And I'd like to start by asking uh, Elk to respond, but in his presentation, Jakub explored a variety of theoretical explanations of how we read the comics page. For instance, he cites the traditional Z pattern, and he also cites other scholars like Hatfield and Groenstein. Could each of you describe the reading process that you feel best describes the comics you're working with? And Elke, I would ask you to start, please. Yeah, 
Um, I'm also super bummed that Yakub couldn't make it because his presentation was really cool. You should totally check it out. Um, I also feel like we had a lot of overlap in ours. Um, in particular, we both talked about um, Thierry Gronstein's The System of Comics, and that was one of the major inspirations for 40 Time Dot Space because the way that I think of it, um, you have like the hyper frame of the page, but then you also have individual panels. So what Thierry talks about in his book is basically how the reader is constantly referencing these the relationships spatio-temporally on the page between panel to panel, but then also page to hyperframe and then across whole books. And I just think that, that that way of reading comics and thinking about comics, I feel like is actually it's it's more realistic. Like it's it's very naturalistic because that's just how human eyes work and how memory works. Um, sort of like how, like, if you think of your favorite comic book, you don't just think about, oh, in this one panel, this one moment, that's what I think this whole comic book is. You think about the whole story, the whole character development and everything basically all at once. So I think that that's a pretty four-dimensionalist way of viewing comics, personally. Thank you, Elk. And Deborah, what about you? What do you think about this? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think this is a really good question. Um, and actually, I wanted to share an image with you guys uh, that gets at some of this. Hold on. Um, so this is a page from uh, the book Manga no Yomikata, uh, or How to Read Comics by Natsume Fusanosuke. And it's uh, one of the major classics of manga scholarship, uh, uh, mar manga formal analysis. And it's really a shame this hasn't been translated into English. Um, but the point that he's making on this page is that um, in shoujo manga, uh, he says that um, the uh, that um, shoujo manga is layered like uh, anime or animation cell, uh, and, and that you have to look not only at the uh, progression across the page, but also at the layering. And so that's what he does here. So he takes um, these two pages uh, and then he numbers all the panels, but then all, he also shows how there's three layers. Um, and uh, the argument that he's making that a lot of manga scholars have made is that particularly with shoujo manga, um, it's, I mean, it is meant to be read from top to bottom and more or less uh, from right to left. Uh, and so there is kind of a, a Z pattern, but it's also meant to be um, taken in as a whole. Uh, and uh, and this is one of the distinctive features of shoujo manga that the artists use the entire page as the um, uh, uh, as a distinct unit. And one of the major criticisms that uh, you would hear of shoujo manga, not just outside of Japan, but also from male critics inside Japan who are not used to reading this way, was they would look at the page and say, I don't know how to read this. This doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and the reason they would say that is because I, I think of this very dense layering and um, uh, uh, kind of Baroque style <laughs> that developed in uh, the 1960s in shoujo manga. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think um, it's an interesting counterpoint to the Z pattern of reading. And I think it's also a reason why we need to consider shoujo manga as part of manga history, because this style of reading is really, really common in Japan. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of manga artists have taken on this uh, elements of this style where they treat the entire page as a, a consistent unit instead of uh, breaking it up into panels. And you see that more and more um, uh, through the 1970s, 1980s, that style really takes hold. Thank you. I really appreciate seeing the image that you shared with us. I, I, I'm not familiar with that work, so that, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. We have a question from one of our, uh, from one of our audience members. This is from Maite Ukaregi. Her, uh, this is her question. Thank you to all of our brilliant panelists. Uh, this question is for Elk that um, overlaps with Jakub's work. I love your exploration of the comic book as a space-time sausage. I'm wondering how you understand serialized comics. Maybe multiverse superhero comics are an extreme example of this within the space sausage framework. <laughs> 
And I'm going to yeah. post this in the um, chat too, so everybody can see. Cool. That is a great question. And <clears throat> I do actually have a bunch written on that. Um, under what chapter was that? Yeah, the book as brain, which is the chapter on string theory, because it is really interesting to consider, especially in like Marvel and DC comics, how like every, you know, however many years a character can be completely scrapped and rewritten. So I like to think of that in terms of like in the Marvel and DC universes as their own multiverse theory and just like take that at face value because it is actually physically possible, um, which is what I explore in the string theory chapter. Um, and I think the interesting thing too is that you can still have like the same threads of this character existing on different planes. Um, and each one of those would just be its own independent space time sausage. I don't think they would be necessarily connected in any way other than like existentially or something. Um, but yeah, that's really interesting to think about. And I think, yeah, I was thinking about that a lot looking at um, Deborah's use of the Harvey P. Carr um american splendor because that series alone like there's just different artists that are drawing him and he just provides the scripts and then the final panel of your example he's like who is harvey picar and it's like well we don't really know exactly because there's just so many different iterations but anyways i hope that answered your question <laughs> deborah could i ask you uh to say a little bit about shoujo manga for us are most of them serialized? Are they standalone stories? Could you describe a little bit of that for us? Uh, there's both. And, you know, it's tended to change over time. Um, uh, in, in the 1960s, when things were developing, I think you saw more short stories. Uh, there were also long series. Um, and then since then, you know, like in every um, print or, you know, like every kind of media, there's more money to be made from a longer running series. And so I think there's been pressure on artists to really um, make their series really, really long. And sometimes uh, they never end. Mm -hmm. um, there's some classics from the 1970s that are, you know, are still kind of ongoing <laughs> um, as long as the artist is willing to do it. So yeah, it's a mix. Um, and, uh, and you know, the artists will also publish short stories, uh, you know, so the way that um, comic or that manga is published in Japan is really different than in the U.S. Um, I, I think probably most of you are aware. Um, so uh, in, in manga are first circulated in anthology magazines that are really thick, and you'll have maybe um, ten or twelve stories per issue, um, and then uh, it'll be serialized in the uh, magazine that's published on really cheap newsprint, and it's meant to be read and thrown away. And then if you like a series, then you can buy it in reprints. Um, and those will run, you know, like uh, sometimes it'll be like, you know, hundreds of volumes uh, in, in the reprints. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, shoujo manga it can be like that. They, it's like they can be shorter, they can be long. Um, and I mean, sometimes the artists do um, uh, like retcon or resuscitate the characters. I mean, I, I think that the way that Marvel and DC have set up their universes is, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of these comics too. It's, it's fascinating, but it's so strange. <laughs> you know, like most narratives don't work that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that um, readers are, they're, they're accustomed to this kind of thing, especially um, in stories that are aimed at younger readers. I mean, one thing that stands out to me is um, uh, in, in my book on shoujo manga, I wrote about the Rose of Versailles, which is uh, one of the big classics of the 1970s. It's just been translated into English. Um, I highly recommend everyone read it. Um, but you know, the, it's a spoiler for something that was written in 1974. Um, but the main characters die at the end or near the end. And um, in looking at the, um, the reader response in the magazines when it first came out, um, you know, the, the girls, they always, this was aimed at teenage girls and they were traumatized. They were not expecting this to happen in the story. And their first reaction was like, bring him back, bring her back. Like bring the, they were expecting that the characters would come back to life in the next issue, which I think is really interesting. Is you know. It was a realistic story. It's not like fantasy or um, like a superhero story where you'd expect that kind of thing to happen. But the reader's first reaction was like, oh, of course they can just be brought back. 
but they're um, also like rich people in the French Revolution. So if you know anything about history, it's not really much of a spoiler there, but <laughs> I do feel sorry for those teenage girls that were disappointed. <laughs> Well, I mean, having read it myself as an adult, it's still shocking, you know, like the way that it's told, it's it's a very emotionally affecting story. Um, you know, when that when that death does take place. Uh, but the artist actually, Ikira Ryoko, she did retcon the story, like she eventually published a whole bunch of um, side stories that take place earlier in the plot. Uh, and so, you know, like she managed to have it both ways. She didn't change the story and bring them back but then she did publish a lot of other you know and, and essentially it was like she was writing fan fiction of her own work which is awesome <laughs> i think biz has a question that she wants to ask um biz are you ready to ask your question yeah i, I can't seem to use q a because i'm the host so i have to chime <laughs> in here so sorry to disrupt um so i have a question for both of you but so i'll start with a question for l um, how did this, the, so you talk in your presentation, you connect the, these ideas of a block time with your own autobiographical writing, which I find really fascinating. And I want to read more of your work because I want to know how these theories of block time impact that work, or if the, these theories of space time and the time sausage, which I might have quoted wrong, if they predated the autobiographical work, like what's the interplay here when you're looking at more autobiographical topics, even though they're, the text that you're, you're presenting to us is framed autobiographically? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think most of the time when I think about block universe theory in relation to my own work, it just makes me feel weird. Um, <laughs> mostly because like as a comics artist and as a trans person, like I have been so many different people in many different forms. So, and I don't know if you've, I mean, like, let's think of, uh, you know, like Erica Moen's Dar comics or something like people change over time and being able to follow someone's whole career um, in autobiography, you get a sort of greater sense of at least like the narrative space-time sausage of that character. So I think that that's, that's something that I like to think about, especially when I think about, you know, like ongoing series, um, especially like American Splendor, like, Harvey Picar is a space-time sausage in my mind because he's just this monolith, you know, because we have all of this work about him that just basically like curdles into this essence of who he is, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's that's probably how I'd answer that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Do you ever play with some of these metaphors in, in the work that you do or explore them through the autobiographical comics, the way that you do it through the sort of philosophical treatise that you've produced? I mean, sometimes, like most, most of my stuff is like pretty generic diary comics. Sometimes I like wax more philosophical and I do, <laughs> I have one that I haven't printed out yet, but that I'm working on that has a lot of like doubling and mirroring in it. Um, <laughs> and I have a couple that are like that in some of my collections. Cause obviously also, you know, as I said, as a trans person, like there's a lot of like introspection and, you know, like figuring out who you are, writing comics helped me figure out who I was because I could look back on my comics and be like, oh, that's what I was feeling at that time. Or, you know, like, that's what I was thinking. That's crazy. Or like things like that. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think also as like a reflective device, autobio comics are a good way of creating that sausage, but in physical form, in the form of a book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, should I continue with my second questions that I have for Deborah or should I pause? You, yeah. should, you can go ahead. I, I just feel weird say, being present. I'm supposed no, no, to be thank you. I, I just <laughs> say, well, I'm so glad that you mentioned Erica Moen. I'm a big fan of Erica Moen's comics. So go ahead and biz with your second question. Okay, so Deborah, when I was reading or viewing your presentation, I was really struck by some of the inconsistencies between the first person narrative, third person narrative, and the images that were sort of representing the figures that either were being narrated in the third person or narrating themselves in the first person. So I wanted you to speak a little bit about that because what, what struck me in particular was that in the manga examples that were featuring third person exegesis, the images still felt incredibly personal. It felt like there was like a first person representation of this third person. And I, so I thought that tension was really fascinating. And I thought I, I, if you could comment on um, the position, the, the image, the role of the images in um, supporting or contradicting beyond the embedding of the, the narration into the images themselves. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, 
I didn't have time to really get into this, but all of the visual conventions of shoujo manga that make it so distinctive are there to encourage um, reader identification with the characters and to represent emotion in visual ways. Um, so the big eyes, the um, uh, the layering and uh, these three-dimensional aspects of the panel that we were just talking about and um, the use of abstract backgrounds. Um, because in most shoujo manga, unlike in um, uh, shonen manga, the story isn't really action-based. So there isn't a lot of action to show. It's, you know, characters sitting around thinking or, you know, talking to each other. And so uh, there's always the danger that it just could become a series of talking heads and it would be visually very uninteresting. And so they, you know, the artists are using these various techniques to uh, uh, externalize the um, interior state of the characters. Uh, Sorry, is that the kind of thing that you were asking? Yeah, so it's more of a, uh, an aesthetic that an overarching aesthetic of of the traditions and manga, even if it feels at odds with the kind of narration that's occurring within the panels. So yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, another feature of shoujo manga in general is that there is a very close, or they, they try to foster a close relationship between the artist or the artist writer you know it's usually one person the mm -hmm. artist and the fans um and among the fans uh, and so they try to create this impression that um you know since the 1970s most of the artists are women um and uh, they do tend to start their careers really young um as teenagers and you know even after they uh, have become quite a bit older than their readers they still try to um, have a very chatty personal tone and so they'll often add little asides or direct address to the readers and then the magazines really encourage um, fan participation and um, contacting the author and uh, interacting with them and then also for the fans to interact with each other um, so I think that's uh, part of it also, like there's this kind of collapsing of the um, narrative voice that's unlike um, uh, what you see like um, in a lot of like high literature novels where it's sort of more detached uh, or, you know, the author is supposed to be a kind of authority figure, but in, in manga, they really, you know, the most successful artists tend to present themselves as just like, oh, I'm just an ordinary girl. <laughs> you know, I'm just like you. Uh, and they, so that, that's also been a big part of the genre. I, but I'm not sure what you mean by uh, the disconnect between the... Um, well, just the very intimate I images, like it felt very first person and very expressive. But one of the examples that you had, I just thought that there was this interesting tension between the third person narration, but the very like personal and intimate images. But I think you, you uh, addressed that accurately in that there's just this convention of intimacy that's being cultivated on these many levels through the images, through the paratext, through the fan culture. So I think that, that answers my question well. Yeah, and then actually I don't have any good examples to show um, right now, but another really common feature of shoujo manga is that um, the artist will put in little asides. So um, unlike in American comics, in, in manga, the um, text is almost always printed because otherwise it's very hard to read the characters. <laughs> so uh, they, they use typesetting uh, instead of like hand lettering. Um, but the artists will often add little handwritten notes um, that are direct addressed to the reader that are um, incorporated into the art or sometimes outside of the panels and off to the side. And so that's another way that the artist is really directly addressing the readers. Um, and sometimes it gets reprinted and sometimes it doesn't. Like sometimes it, it'll be like a little extra thing outside of the panel and it'll say like, send me a letter. Um, you know, or, you know, here's what we're thinking, you know, here's what's going to happen in the next issue, you know, write, write in and let us know what you think. Um, and sometimes you see it in reprint, sometimes you don't. I am loving this formalist discussion. I really am. Uh, <laughs> that leads me to a, another question that I have for Elk. Um, Elk, you, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to connect your work with Deborah's work too. Um, and so for this question, um, could you talk a little bit about the impact of a 4D interpretation on traditional narrative boxes or narrative devices? How might your idea of a slice of space-time uh, 
be used to explain how the action or scene in the comics panel may not take the same amount of time as a narrative box suggests. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about this a lot looking at Deborah's presentation also because yeah. for instance, you use the term like stream of consciousness, which for me makes me think of like Virginia Woolf just personally. Um, but the interesting thing about Virginia Woolf is that it really is just this sort of like disembodied text just sort of floating off into space that you just sort of ride along. Whereas in manga, like you actually get to step into a character's mind set by looking at their expressions and their body language. And, you know, you can sense that like, especially since the, the text that surrounds the characters doesn't have a box containing it, it feels sort of like, it feels more naturalistically like a thought, like there isn't a set amount of time that those words are supposed to be existing in. It's just this sort of like timeless moment that's happening like in a reverie or something, which is more accurate to what feelings feel like um, in terms of how you could see it portrayed on the page. So I like to think about panelists, comics or com you know moments within panels that don't have separation between text and image because that gives a sort of sense of timelessness. Like I talk about the family circus um, which I think is super cheesy, but it, formally speaking, it's very interesting because yeah. each one of those is, it's just a single panel. It's a circle, right? And family circus, circus means circle in Latin. So really the form is the content in that because it's just this timeless world of this little nuclear family that just sort of exists on its own floating in this little circle on the, on the newspaper page, sort of unchanging, um, so that's that's definitely a four dimensionalist way of thinking of things. But if you want to place things back in time, you know, um, Scott McCloud talks about this in his comics in terms of closure. So the gaps between gutters basically differentiate one moment from the next moment. I argue that basically any moment is completely arbitrary. So you could have a panel of someone, you know, swinging a baseball bat and you assume that that is just the instant where they're hitting the ball. You could have another panel like in a manga where there are two people strolling in a park, you know, like how long does that panel last? How long is it supposed to last? Is it supposed to just evoke this feeling of being in a park with a loved one? Um, so yeah, yeah, there's definitely, there's so much to say on this topic. Um, just because it's so dense and deep and cool. So thank you for that question. <laughs> uh, thank you for the answer. That's, that's a lot to think about. Um, yeah, and I want to add to that, if that's OK. Absolutely, um, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So in the presentation, I mentioned the psychological novel and like Henry James and stuff like that. Um, and the reason I brought that up is just because that's what comes across in the um, uh, narratology literature, you know, which is based in novels. Uh, you know, the manga artists weren't necessarily thinking in those terms, although, I mean, some of them were aware of that style of writing, and particularly um, Takemiya Keiko and Hagi Omoto, who uh, wrote The Heart of Thomas, which I had some images from. Um, uh, and their big influence um, was uh, Herman Hess, hmm. um, and particularly the novel Damien. Uh, it's a kind of, you know, like boys love coming of age, uh, buildings Roman, which, uh, you know, they, they really liked. Uh, and so, you know, on the one hand, they're, they're influenced by this kind of European novel tradition. I and mean, on the other hand, um, this kind of um, floating, uh, disjointed sort of poetic style of stream of consciousness narration uh, comes directly from girls' magazines in the 1920s and 30s, and particularly authors like Yoshio Nobuko. Um, who wrote what was called shoujo shosetsu or girls novels um, in a, a style that was called bibun or like a flowery um, poetic writing style and she was really known for her um, uh, like floaty uh, uh, disjointed text style so the um, uh, you know, partly the story would be narrated in kind of a traditional sense and then there would be these moments of just like uh, sentence fragments that kind of drift across the page. And, and that, um, since the 1920s and 30s was, you know, was, um, referred to as a shoujo shumi or girls' tastes or like girls' style. Um, and that really just continued um, as shoujo manga developed into a genre in the 1950s and 60s and artists picked it up from that. Um, so yeah, it's like, an, and then you see these artists like uh, 
uh, Hagiomoto who are kind of joining this older um, shoujo style and uh, these new influences that they're getting um, uh, from European literature. So it, yeah, it's this kind of mashup of like uh, pre-war Japanese girls culture and then you know this uh, psychological like um, buildings roman that they were trying to do. That's so cool. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Absolutely. Because Heart of Thomas takes place at, doesn't it take place at a German boarding school? Yeah, yeah, that's the reason. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, like the, it was that and uh, there was a movie that came out that they also were, they were sort of copying. Um, oh, it was a French one. There was a L'Ami Particulier. Oh. Uh, and that's so, so uh, the Heart of Thomas takes place in a German boarding school and uh, Takamiya Keiko's um, The Poem of the Wind in the Tree, which she was writing at the same time and they were roommates, um, uh, is set in a French, French boarding school. Hmm. So they were both working off of these same sources. Wow. Yeah, and, and The Heart of Thomas has been translated to English, but uh, The Poem of the Wind in the Tree, I think not yet. Hmm. Yeah. It's hard to find publishers for these older uh, classic manga. Which is a I'm shame. I'm sure. Publishing is always a question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, Takemiya Keiko is now the head of um, the uh, manga studies department at Seika, Kyoto Seika University and runs and helps to run the International Manga Museum. Um, so I asked her, then why haven't your, more of your stuff been translated? And she's like, I know the publishers won't do it. <laughs> if Jakob were here, maybe he could talk a little bit about translation for us because he yeah. that's one of his specialties, you know? Yeah. Um, Deborah, if I could follow up with you, um, we've been talking about the, the, the feeling of connection, you know, between the artist and the reader and among the readers. And I, I want to follow up on something that you said at the end of your presentation. You said there's an immediacy in speech balloons, uh, and there's an and there's an even greater immediacy in text that it's integrated into art. And I, I, there were just so many examples to think of. You know, uh, Scott McCloud's sculptor, where the the, um, the bodies join in with the other 3D objects around it. So many examples of that. And I, and I thought of um, uh, Will Eisner and the way that he incorporates uh, words into, into, the, into the images. And I wonder if you could say more about that, uh, because I was struck by your use of the term immediacy. Um, yeah. and, and I was thinking about sound and I was thinking about image. Could you follow up on that for us? Well, I guess I didn't really theorize that very much. I mean, I just used that because that's what Art Spiegelman said in his uh, um, uh, comic strip that I cited at the beginning, right? He says, there's an immediacy in the use of speech balloons. Um, so I sort of picked up on that. And actually I didn't even find that strip until after I had um, written a you know, preliminary draft of the presentation. And then I was looking around for images and then I sort of stumbled across this online. I was like, oh, okay, you know, he's- uh, Serendipity, yeah. Yeah, and also um, I didn't talk about it in this presentation, but another topic that I want to discuss in this book is um, uh, four panel strips. Oh, yeah. I feel like this is an area <laughs> of formal analysis that's been really under theorized. Um, and particularly in uh, manga studies, people don't talk about it very much. Um, even though it exists in Japan also. Mm. Uh, uh, so yeah, like I just sort of stumbled across this thing and then I was like, oh, okay, yeah, this is exactly what I'm talking about. And then he uses this word immediacy. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. You know, it is worth uh, thinking more about this. Like what exactly makes it more like immediate or um, engaging? Um, and I mean, another thing that I didn't, I cut from this presentation and um, the interest of time is um, from Nick Susanus' book on flattening, hmm. which I assume you guys have read, right? He yes, has this I, big Yaku section. Yaku mentions that in his presentation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, he has this big section at the beginning where he talks about the difference between, um, you know, like Western and Eastern ways of thinking about words and text mm -hmm. and how um, in Western cultures, we've always been really careful to separate um, words and image. And there's a, a, a deep-seated cultural um, fear of uh, the hybridity of um, mixing words and images together. And that has never existed in Japan, which, you know, you know, like we all know the famous ukiyo-e um, 
woodblock prints and things like that it is always tended to mix um, text and image. Uh, and, and so you don't see that same kind of anxiety in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, he gives, I mean, you know, it's always problematic to make these kind of big cultural uh, uh, sweeping statements, but I think he's onto something when he, he says that, you know, they, there, there's a different approach to these things. Um, and I, I think that also feeds into these, you know, periodic moral panics about comics that you see in the West, which like never really caught on in Japan. Mm -hmm. Like the, um, occasionally there'll be some outcry against, uh, you know, obscenity or violence in manga in Japan, but not nearly to the extent that you saw in the US. Um, and, and you know, I really take your point here, and it's ironic too because we have to, we should remember that writing systems come from drawn images. I mean, that's how writing developed to, to begin with. So the fact that people are fearful of the hybridity in Western culture is a little su surprising. Maybe, maybe yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, it's frustrating to see this continue even in comics scholarship. You know, there's there's like deep uh, um, suspicion of hybridity or like no one wants, it, it seems like, you know, some, I, I don't know how to say this correctly, but um, Hannah Miodrag, I think talks about this a lot um, when she, you know, gives an overview of, of comic studies that people don't want to say that comics is a hybrid medium or mm -hmm. that it's somehow devaluing comics to say that it is hybrid. Right. Um, and you have to like pick a camp or you have to like promote it either, either as literature or as art. Um, and I feel like those are all losing battles. You know, like we need to just say like, look, this is hybrid medium. You know, like it, why, why do we have to engage in these kinds of intellectual debates still? <laughs> a lot of ink has been spilled on that. Uh, yes, absolutely. I know. <laughs> Uh, I guess part of it is that people have fun arguing about these uh, these positions, but I, I agree with Hanamiya Drag. It's um, I think there's much more to be gained by talking about it as uh, from a more expansive or encompassing perspective than that. So I yeah I agree yeah, and I mean a lot of it also is you know like um, cultural cachet, right? So. Uh, and you want to be able to say like, oh, this is literature, this is art. And we see the same thing in manga, you know, like why does everyone talk about manga as developing from traditional Japanese arts when it, it clearly <laughs> didn't? Um, it's because they want to claim that it's a highbrow, or it has these highbrow roots when it absolutely doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and back to your point on the hybridity, I was thinking, um, especially in Japanese comics, but also in some American comics, I feel like really the only place where people feel comfortable making their letters more art-like is really just with sound effects, which we see in Will Eisner, obviously, with um, and in the Stan Lee comics that you were looking at, you know, the like spiral of S's going up and he's like, look at this sound effect, ladies and gentlemen. So <laughs> I think that, yeah. And maybe, maybe it is because in Japan, you know, um, the, the text is really, you know, people learn it as calligraphy as well as just casually. And even just, I mean, yeah, I think, especially I guess, now that- I, mean, I, don't, I don't know, I always hesitate, you know, like I feel like you're in, in, it's getting into dangerous orientalist territory if you start to talk about Chinese characters or Japanese characters as pictures, um, because they're not, they're lexicographical symbols, you know, they're, um, uh, in, in, it's a writing system, it's not- um, Oh drawing. yeah, absolutely. And you know, yeah, I mean, like in in pre-modern Japan, people learned or wrote with a brush, but you know, now everyone writes with a pen or a pencil. Um, and computer. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I understand what you're saying. I don't want to get into that too much, but yeah, I mean, certainly. Uh, I guess one of the questions had been about sound effects. Sound effects are really much bigger deal in manga than they are in. Um, Western comics, and it's not just because of difference in the writing system, it's because of difference in the, um, the grammar and the way that the language works. Um, so Japanese language has a lot more sound effect words than English does, like by orders of magnitude a lot more. And the um, sound effect words that they have um, are divided into two big classes. And one is um, sound imitating words that we have like in English, like click or snap or um, uh, 
uh, bump that imitate the sound. But then there's another class that um, are either uh, representing emotions or they're not they're not imitating a particular sound that exists or they're they're um, uh, they're creating sound for something that in real life doesn't have any sound. Uh, and, and those get used extensively in manga because they're so expressive. And particularly in shoujo manga, they'll get used a lot to indicate how a character is um, thinking or feeling. Um, and actually, like some shoujo manga artists who are not particularly adept artists, <laughs> their art will be really stiff. And then they kind of cover over it with all of these sound effects. Like, they'll have just a kind of tableau of the character and then they'll, they'll give you the emotional content in the sound effect and not in like the, the art or even the movement. Like they'll have a, a word that, you know, like a sound effect of somebody standing. Um, and I've started to see this come into English language comics a little bit from artists who clearly grew up reading a lot of shoujo manga and translation. And it still feels so strange to me to see like an English language comic and then, you know, like an image of someone standing and then next to it in English, it says stand up. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I like that, that mixing of uh, um, uh, idiom. I think that's a good thing. Well, uh, I, I am surprised. I am looking at the time and it is already an hour. We have been going and it's been great. Um, but in ICAF, we try to be very respectful of people's times. And so I, I want to bring our panel to a close. I want to thank Deborah and I want to thank Elk for being with us tonight. I want to thank Jakub, even though he wasn't able to be with us tonight, he made such an important contribution with his presentation too. Um, I'd like to remind all of the ICAF audience members that we will have another monthly virtual roundtable in February, another in March, and then our final one for this conference session will be in April. So we still have a lot of ICAF left to go in 2021. So thank you again, everybody, for being with us. Um, and that closes out our virtual panel. <laughs>